The Lord be with you. Also with you. I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ on this beautiful Sunday morning. Welcome you to Mount Bethel United Methodist Church. My name is Eric Prinshaw. I'm the pastor here, and it's my delight to be worshiping with you today. I had a few announcements as we start our service. Um, I hope that many of you receive our weekly email with some of the news and events that are going on. Um, if you're not, uh, I invite you to let me know or contact the church office. But we send out a prayer list along with that email, and I wanted to highlight a few of those prayer concerns. We, uh, the Mount Bethel family extends loving sympathy to the family of Elaine and Justin Diggs. Upon the passing of Elaine's cousins, Kathy Emery and David Emery. We also extend our love to the family of Louise Beasley, who passed away earlier this month. We also remember a co-worker of Jackie Beaver, who has lost her daughter to COVID-19 um, at the age of 18. So we pray for her family in Virginia um, and all those who have tested positive for the virus. We also remember um, the family of Kathleen Needham. She has been um, put on hospice care, and we um, remember their family in the coming days. We're also thankful to have one of our student uh, pastors back with us today. Stephen Fitch is joining us. So give a, give a shout out to Stephen if you see him. Um, you remember Jay and Stephen as they begin their semester at Duke. Um, today is Communion Sunday. We'll be celebrating Holy Communion. And I just wanted to give a, a couple instructions in that regard. Uh, we will be using pre-packaged communion elements. And so one of our um, servers will come and offer you uh, the elements in your car, and so they will hand you um, a cup, and in, in the cup will be some grape juice and a wafer. You'll have to peel off the top layer uh, to get the wafer, and then peel off another layer for the cup. And so when, uh, when you receive that, I would invite you to just hold that with you, and I'll give instructions uh, for all of us to receive communion together as we celebrate um, Christ's presence with us. So I have one um, final announcement as we begin this morning. In, in my sermon later, I'm going to be talking about um, sibling rivalry a little bit. And uh, I'm, I'm pleased to share that um, Carly and I are going to have a new perspective on sibling rivalry because we are expecting our second child. <laughs> So I, I, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm just sharing that publicly with you now, and so I, we covet your prayers and your support um, during this time. So thank you so much. Let us continue with our worship um, as we glorify God this morning. Thank you.
Good morning and welcome to Mount Bethel this morning. How is everybody? So Pastor Eric and I had a little conversation last week that has stuck with me all week long. And it was over this cross and he was talking about when he came here, he didn't realize that on Sunday that he'd have a cross that he would literally have to bear and carry out each week. And that just rang around in my head and made me think that, you know, there was only one person that's ever made it to this planet that didn't have a cross to bear. And his name was Jesus Christ. And since he didn't have a cross to bear, he chose to pick up all of ours. So he carried our cross to the hill and stood in our place. So we come together this morning to celebrate Jesus, who didn't have a cross to bear, but bore ours instead. So if you would, please join me in prayer. Holy Spirit, please come down and join us all together into the body of Christ. Help us to see the need in the world and help us to be your light to the world. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our Psalter reading this morning is from Psalm 149. You can follow along with me in your Bibles if you have them. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of the faithful. Let Israel be glad in its maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with tambourine and lyre. For the Lord takes his pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with victory. Let the faithful exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their couches. Let the high praises of God be in their throats and their two-edged swords in their hands to execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings with fetters and their nobles with chains of iron, to execute on them the judgment decreed. This is glory for all his faithful ones. Praise the Lord. The New Testament reading is from Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 14. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet and any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. to God. song 
for our anthem this morning is called Your Labor is Not in Vain. And we think about all those um, who work, those who are employed, those who are unemployed or underemployed, those who have been um, challenged because of the virus. We know that oftentimes our labor is not recognized for what it is, but our God is with us and our God sees us. The gospel lesson today is from Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Conflict. Even just saying the word might fill us with anxiety and dread or shame. There are a few rare individuals that might thrive in the midst of conflict, but I don't know about you, I avoid conflict. I don't like it. I like to keep the peace and maintain good relationships. I venture to guess most of us don't like conflict, but the truth is that conflict is an inevitable part of being human. Conflict might happen within a marriage, between family members, brothers and sisters, between business partners, neighbors, friends, and yes, even church members. Conflict happens when our wants and our desires are opposed to one another for whatever reason, or when the fulfillment of my desire is incompatible with the desires of someone else. And conflict and disagreement, it can drive a wedge between relationships. It can split apart bonds that were once strong. Family members can go months or years without speaking to one another due to conflict. A church can be split apart by conflict. But in our passage today, Jesus is pointing to another way, a different way. Jesus is inviting us to a way to manage conflict in a healthy way that can strengthen the bonds between us and demonstrate love to our neighbors. And in this way, navigating conflict in our Christian faith has the potential to bring us closer together and whether or not we can reach that peaceful resolution to the conflict, we are all called to seek reconciliation. Now, I told you I was going to talk about sibling rivalry. So I, I learned about conflict by growing up in a family with uh, three brothers. I was the oldest brother, and I had two younger brothers. And when I look back on it, I'm, I'm sure that I was responsible for for fair share of conflict in the family. One example in particular that comes to mind is riding in the back of our Ford Explorer going on some family trip together, and we would like to bug each other, uh, you know, when, when you're confined to one seat for hours on end, some of that pent-up energy is bound to come out somewhere. We would have to draw, like, imaginary lines between the seats that we couldn't cross, and eventually, uh, you know, when my mom and dad have enough of our fighting, they would say that we weren't allowed to touch one another anymore. And, of course, that's when we played one of our favorite games. You hold your finger right up next to their face and say, I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you, I'm not touching you. Well, um, you know, we, we, we had a lot of fun together. Um, but I, I could just be, uh, when I look back on it, I could be annoying and, and bothersome to my brothers. Some of our trips, we would drive through the windy roads of the Smoky Mountains in East Tennessee and, you know, um, I, I would take, take it upon myself to, at every turn, just throw my weight to the other side. And then when we turned again, throw my weight back to the other side and just say, well, it's a windy road. This just kind of happens. It was like I was playing bumper cars in the back seat. But of course, now that, now that we're all grown up, I do get along really well with my brothers. I have a good relationship and we love one another. And we even have an annual guys weekend where we get together uh, with my dad and our brothers and away from spouses and kids. We definitely had our moments of conflict, but most of them were pretty minor, it seems. There are some times where conflict among family members can be more deep and painful. Sometimes parents and children can be so at odds that they don't want to see each other again or... Sometimes people never outgrow petty childhood conflicts that just get worse over time. The singer-songwriter David Wilcox writes a song about a father who is 
dividing his estate between three brothers. And he says that all three brothers love their father, but he's brought them here today to see these papers and these lawyers to divide the old estate. All three feel like they're the favorite. He loves each of them the best, but these documents he gave them will now put them to the test. So they open all the writings that will prove the rightful heir to this home they remember, the right to settle there. Each one looks at what they're given, studies what he's shown. They hold their maps that show possession of this place they've called their home. And at first they sigh with satisfaction when they see what's on their maps. Each one is given all that he wanted, but the boundaries overlap. In this song, it, it seems like it's the intention of the father not just not to give the children just everything they want. Rather, he desires the children to work together to resolve conflict, to compromise, to share, to live in harmony. So the boundaries overlap. They have to work it out together. Now, there is a deeper meaning to this song, um, but I will suffice to say that you know, the father in this song is presented as God the father. That God knows it is impossible for each of us to just get everything that we want. Resources are limited and ultimately our, the boundaries overlap. Perhaps the way that we deal with conflict and the way that we treat each other in the middle of our conflict is more important than just getting what we want. How can we treat one another with respect and handle conflict in a faithful and loving way? And that's what our lectionary text for today looks at. It's the Jesus model for conflict. It's something that's radical, especially today in the midst of the hostile and divisive times that we live in. Christ's call to reconciliation is challenging. Jesus tells us, if another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. Now, there's a lot that's said right there at the beginning. The first thing is that we have to see each other as brothers and sisters. The NRSV translation says, if another member of the church sins... But when we look at the Greek text, the word for member of the church, it's actually brother and sister. So we understand the church is a family, and we are, we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. The first step to facing conflict is understanding that we are all children of God. The church is more than a voluntary organization. The church is more than a social club that... The church is more than something that we just join and come when we feel like it. No, Christ calls us closer together. The church is a family. We're called to treat one another with love and respect out of reverence for Christ. The second thing we learn here in this text is we have to be willing to address our conflict face to face. And this is a really hard thing to do. It's hard for us to confront someone directly. It's so much easier to complain to someone else about the issue or to gossip about the person. But here Jesus is teaching us that triangles are deadly. What, what do I mean triangles? Well, triangles have three sides, right? Well, if there's a problem between two people, triangulation is when the problem is not faced head on, but the third person is brought in either to complain or offload the conflict onto someone else. It's kind of like if a brother and a sister have an argument about who should be um, in charge of the video game controller. Well, who do they go to? They bring in their mom or dad. They're sometimes unable to work it out between themselves. But God calls us first to work out the issue head on with each other. Now, in my experience in ministry, I know it, it's very easy to be involved in these unhealthy triangles. Someone might come to me telling, that, telling me that they have a problem with someone else, and I, and I hope 
my first response in that situation would be, well, have you talked to that person about it? And I hope that if anyone has an issue with me, I mean, I know it's never going to happen, right? But, you know, if, if it did happen, I, I hope that they would come to me to talk about it rather than spreading rumors among everyone else. Jesus tells us to talk about these faults one-on-one -on -one and alone. And it seems like the goal isn't just to change the other person's mind. Rather, it's the goal is to have a conversation and to listen. It says that if a brother or sister listens to you, you have regained that one. Conversation and listening. These are two skills that are in very short supply today. As we glance across our world and in our culture, it's so easy to hide behind a computer screen and say whatever we want to on social media. It's hard to listen to someone else because so often we can just be concerned about getting our own point across. What if we actually had a conversation? What if we actually listened to one another? I once heard about a school faculty whose meetings were so conflicted and disrupted, they had to call in a mediator. And the first thing that they had to do to deal with their conflict was that they had to make a rule. Before anyone could speak or offer their opinion, they first had to summarize what the previous person had said. This actually forced them to listen instead of just trying to shout their point of view. As we head into this conflicted election season where there are public debates, referendums on candidates' character, attack ads on television, conflict within households, neighbors, and friends, and the echo chamber of our social media feed, I wonder what would it look like to follow Christ's call to reconcile? What would it look like to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry? What would it look like for us to have a conversation face to face and listen to one another? We have to admit that the reconciliation and peace of Christ is not something that comes through 140 characters on a tweet or a soundbite on TV. But we know that conflict is not just in politics. We have conflict here in the body of Christ in the church and one of the reasons I love the church is that we are so different and the church is not just made up of a group of like-minded people who think the same thing we come from different backgrounds we're made up of different ages we have our opinions our perspectives and we all seek to be faithful in following Christ and our diversity is beautiful but it also means that we have different ways of seeing things and conflict is unavoidable. As one commentator on this passage says, the subject matter of this could not be more fitting for Christian communities in every age, place, and situation. Conflict is not new. One of the things that plagues most Christian communities or any other community is the ability to handle confrontation, disagreement, mutual accountability when it comes to sin. We simply don't know how to live together, fight together, and stay together. And this is because we, all of us, not just our brother or sister, are sinners. To achieve peace, we have to acknowledge our own part in the conflict. We have to acknowledge that we are all sinners. We contribute to the conflict. None of us are perfect in order to heal our conflicts and divisions, we have to recognize we have all sinned. Christ has gone to great lengths to reconcile us to God. As Chris so beautifully stated earlier, Christ has borne the cross of all of us so that we might live in peace. Christ has restored us and brought us back together, and Christ calls us to reconcile with one another. Now this doesn't mean we're going to be buddy-buddy with everyone we meet. We will be annoyed, we may get frustrated, we may feel hurt, we may feel betrayed. A conflict can be a stumbling block in our faith, or we can see conflict as an opportunity to listen, 
to practice compassion, to turn toward each other in love. The most wonderful and encouraging thing that I hear in our passage today is that Christ is present with us right in the middle of our biggest and deepest conflicts. Now, at the end of our passage, we hear, for wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am among them. Now, you've probably heard that before, right? Wherever two or three are gathered, we say that. Um, whenever we come together in worship, maybe a small group or a Bible study, even if it's small, even if it's just two people, we know that Christ is present when we come to worship God, when we come to discuss the scriptures. But did you know, did you realize the context of what Jesus says? The context is being in the middle of a conflict. The point is not just that Christ is present when two Christians come together, but the point is that Christ is present in the challenging process of conflict resolution. This should fill us with hope that at the point of our deepest disagreements, deepest divisions, controversies, and differing opinions, Christ is already there. This morning we come to this table. We celebrate Christ's presence among us. We celebrate the fact that we are one body in Christ, and we each have our different roles, but we are all bound together. We are brothers and sisters, and we are called to forgive, called to love, and called to reconcile. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. At this time, I'm going to invite up our student pastor, Stephen Fitch, who will offer our prayer this morning. As we come before God this morning in prayer, um, let us uh, have a posture of, of openness and reverence. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved son, Jesus Christ, that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Let us pray. Oh God, you long to draw us to yourself in a realm of peace in your heavenly kingdom. We pray that you would bless all who struggle with relationships in the home and in the workplace, in the church, that you would bring your reconci reconciling power. Oh God, your gift of faith to us grows by use for the asking. You, you grow us as we call out to you. You lead us into your redemption in Christ. We pray that you would make us aware of this treasure that we have in Christ, that we, you would let us taste and share its fruits, especially this morning as we celebrate Holy Communion. Lord Christ, you knew the sins of your followers. You know the faults in us, but you forgave them, you forgave us, and you encourage us in the way of love. Let our awareness of our faults lead us to encourage one another to turn to you. O oh Lord of life, you eased the burdens of so many by healing their sickness and wounds. This morning, Lord, we especially lift up those who have passed on and have died in your grace. 
that you would comfort them and guide them now. Lord, we pray for nurses and doctors and those who are caring for the ill, especially in this trying time. Oh God, we pray that the, for the alien and the stranger, for those who are outcast and those who feel alone. We know they are dear to your heart. We pray that you would give us the humility and generosity to welcome those who are different from us, that you would make us your church, your people, full of unity and grace. O oh God, we live in constant need. To whom shall we go but to you? You are our God. You are both our Father and our Lord, our Maker, our Savior, tending our days with delicate care. We thank you for your love and mercy this day, and we ask you to help us to forgive as we have been forgiven, to give as we have received. This we, your children, ask of you in your tender mercy. Amen. And now, let us be so bold as to pray as our Lord Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, I invite you to join us in our confession of sin before God and one another in the words found in your bulletin. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. As a forgiven and reconciled people, let us now offer signs of peace. So I encourage you to share the peace of Christ. You know, honk your horn, wave your hand, send a text message, share God's peace. <laughs> At this time, I will invite our ushers and communion servers to come forward um, as we receive God's tithes and our offerings.
பாப்பா வருது சார் Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for these gifts that have been offered. We pray that you would bless them to the advancement of your kingdom, that it might come on earth as it is in heaven. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. I invite you to follow along.
using the words in your bulletin with our liturgy this morning. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. When we break the bread, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? And when we share the cup, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The table is set and we are invited to come to taste and see that the Lord is good. As our musicians lead us, I invite you to receive the elements in your car by taking the wafer and the juice. Know that God is with you. Amen.
we receive the gifts of the table, we pause to give thanks. And so I now invite you to join me in our prayer after receiving. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now receive this benediction. May the God of peace who brought back from the dead Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, nourish your soul, give you strength, give you the courage to follow God's call to reconciliation. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.